I made a vow to myself, um, very young age, that if I ever um, did become famous, that I would tell the truth about who I was. What I did know for sure was that if it happened to get to anyone's attention uh, that I was queer, then my career would be over. It was really certain. I had no positive role images. I, I knew no one who was gay until I was uh, 18. And I think that's what keeps people closeted about their sexuality because there's been such a tradition in Hollywood. You know, you, you are what you appear to be, and that's how it must be. There is a, a, a cumulative sense of unreality uh, in Hollywood product, and that unreality is reflected in the awkwardness with which they talk about gay and lesbian characters and the way how awkwardly they're, they're put into things. We're the only, uh, one of the only minority groups that's still okay to make jokes about, to ridicule. Uh, it's still socially acceptable to make fag jokes in a lot of circles. I think unfortunately, because of the AIDS crisis, um, people are just terrified and they will not um, take that mask off and come out. The homophobia that is surrounding the disease is what is continuing to make the problem. A side effect or something that's happening concurrently is that there's a real effort by the right wing to silence gay voices. And what's tragic is that, you know, a lot of these, you know, talented gay people and people with HIV are dying. We're losing them to AIDS, but we're also losing these voices to, to censorship, basically. For all of us who've lost so many friends to AIDS, that you just, it's like you, you want it to go away. You just wish it didn't exist. And the reality is, is that it does exist. What's terrible about HIV is that you tend to close all the, all the doors and feel that there's no one who can understand. Um, I mean, I still feel that rage in me some days. This week, I mean, I mean, I, I still feel the sense of nobody gets it, nobody gets it. I think there are so few images of gays and lesbians on, on film that it's sort of like they have to represent the entire scope of the population of gays and lesbians. Uh, I think that there's enormous suppression of any positive images about us. Clearly all this flap about how if you show a positive gay character, you'll lose your sponsors. I think there is far too much fear of what the fundamentalists and the crazies will say. and. Um, it's, uh, and I blame the media for giving them so much respectability. And the negative images, of course, are, I think, very purposeful. I think it's very much in the interest of the hierarchy, the sort of heterosexist world, to keep us looking like we're some kind of uh, weird fringe group. Uh, and they work very hard at it. And one of the most important ways they do it, I think, is to hold this threat of the end of career over the head of any actor or actress who even hints about coming out. The climate still, I think, is one that is, um, I think it's changing because of pressure groups like ACT UP and Queer Nation who are doing some, and GLAAD, who are doing some tremendous work. But I think that uh, people are still terrified to come out. There are lots of gay actors working who are very, um, who pass as very macho, heterosexual, study kind of guys. I mean, it's, um, who I'm sure are terrified that if word ever got out they were gay, would be, um, their careers would be over. I wish all the people that we all know who were gay in this business had the guts to stand up and say, I'm a worthwhile human being too. I deserve the love and, and respect that everybody else gets. And there are too many actors and actresses and heads of studios and record companies and whatever who haven't done it. And I don't know what they're denying except themselves. And what's, what's the worst crime than denying yourself? I don't know one. To come out as a person with HIV requires an enormous personal courage and clarity. Um, I think that people don't understand how much better they will feel once they've done that. Um, it's uh, there that there are so many um, 
g curtains and there's so much darkness that, that goes away once you are open about it. I can talk about the fear that I harbor and live with. I'm HIV and my, my employer doesn't know. They will now. Anyone with HIV appropriately is, has great anxiety about his, in, his health insurance and his viability as a worker. And that is nationwide, not just in Hollywood. I worry that if they know, they'll replace me. You know, I mean, I, I don't see this happening in any obvious or explicit way. I don't think somebody's going to go, oh, God, he's HIV positive. Let's get rid of him. But I'm afraid that, that wheels will be put in motion, that they, I won't be given uh, long-term responsibilities. I won't be given uh, interesting things to cover, things to cover that matter or that will be long-term stories. Uh, I'm afraid it would isolate me. You have to create the image that everything's fine to stay working, and um, that's an extra burden for somebody who's sick. And while I was in the hospital, a very good friend of ours, our, Brad's best friend actually, got a phone call from a woman who's the head of casting in a very big studio. And she said, listen, I have to tell you, I've heard this rumor that Brad Davis has AIDS. And I just want to say two things to you. One, if it's true, I'm very sorry. And if it's not true, you better stop this rumor right now. In a situation where this kid should have expected support and should have gotten support and should have been helped through his last project, he was having to continuous, continuously worry about people discovering what his condition was. And that is inexcusable. Period. It is inexcusable. Period. He did his job. And he did it very well. And it was very hard to accept that he couldn't talk about it to anybody and that he couldn't be free to say, here I am, I'm in great health, I'm HIV positive, and so what? I'm fine, and why should this have to be an issue? I don't want to be identified as a person by a virus that I carry. The great tragedy of the 80s um, was that AIDS phobia um, engendered a kind of homophobia. I think each person has to deal with their own homophobia. And, it, you know, I think gays and lesbians, there's two kinds of homophobia to me. There's our own internal homophobia, and then there's the homophobia that the heterosexual community has. And theirs is based on ignorance, and ours is based on fear. What I do at home, uh, you know, is, as long as I'm not committing any crime, I don't think it has anything to do with my job, as long as I'm on time and uh, do my work properly. You die twice with AIDS. You die when everybody finds out you have it, you, you die up here in their, in their minds. You, you're dead. And then, after that, you have to go through the agonizing ordeal of the physical decline. I believe that people should only have to die once. I think dying once is enough. It was also another kind of loss that um, I think is really um, very painful. And that's the loss of the productivity and potential and creativity because so many people are spending so much time having to take care of themselves. I think this is uh, so devastating because we can't cure it, we can't fix it. I'm just scared, you know, uh, scared for them, um, worried for them. What you can do is try to educate yourself as much as possible and to love the ones that love you. I'm here to tell the story of um, my husband, Brad Davis, struggle through six years after he learned he was HIV positive. Uh, Stephen Kolzak um, uh, was a casting director in Hollywood um, who appeared to know absolutely every actor on television. He would just click the the clicker at the TV and I put him in a series, I brought him out for an audition he, and he had a, an immense um, 
pride in actors and a, an immense uh, love for them. Is this for Phil's picture? Yes. <laughs> um, Phil Mandelker was a very successful and talented television producer. Gary Keeper was a program executive at Showtime, which is one of the pay television networks, um, someone with whom I had worked over a long period of time. During doing time on Maple Drive, uh, the actor who played Andy, who was Matt's best friend, Philip Linton, uh, and to whom the film was dedicated, uh, unfortunately he died, I think, three weeks before it was telecast. I moved two doors down from Colin Higgins, who I had heard through the grapevine was gay, and um, you know, he had done, you know, he's done tremendous work in Harold and Maude and, and uh, uh, Bessel Horror House and so many things. I mean, just a, just a really fantastic writer, director, um, and he had been sort of an idol of mine. Ben Rubin was the casting director of Wilshire Court Productions and over the three and a half year period that he was with the company, he was responsible for the casting of 35 movies. We discussed it on many, many occasions and we decided between us that we would just not talk about it. At first there were rumors about the fact that Gary was ill, uh, which were unconfirmed by Gary. Uh, and then work absences and it became evident to those of us who knew him that there was something uh, wrong which he reluctantly admitted to. And we were talking about you know his future plans and what he was going to do and he seemed to be very modest in his goals and I and I was kind of taken aback by that and he reached over to his shirt and pulled back his shirt a little bit and he had a Hickman but what I remember about him was when he got diagnosed. To me at that point, Stephen became himself. He, as we used to like to say, Stevie came out with a vengeance. Stephen was the one who made me understand that I had lost my country because of AIDS, but that I could still be, I could still be a force and a power that would tell my country what was wrong. We sort of talked about it among ourselves, and there was never, the, the best part of Ben's situation was that there was never really a question about, well, you know, we're gonna get rid of him. I mean, it was how Ben could stay there and work and how we would just go with whatever course Ben's health took. Jimmy Breslin wrote a series of stories about David for which he won a Pulitzer Prize. And uh, this is probably the, the most shameful thing I've ever done in my life but when Jimmy was beginning the interview process with David I said would you please David not mention me by name in the interview. The image that I have of Colin that stays with me is on his last birthday um, there was a birthday party thrown for him and a lot of his celebrity friends were there everyone who worked with him in all different movies and and um, Shirley McLean was kind of co-hosting the party. And uh, we were all pretending there was balloons and, and it was catered, there was beautiful uh, little candles. Lit. They'd, they'd strung Japanese lanterns outside in the backyard, you know, this beautiful backyard, beautiful pool. And it was such a lovely, lovely setting for this supposedly happy little birthday party. But really, we all knew it was his last, that was it it became very clear to him that what do I do now? You know, now I'm not only a former alcoholic, but now I'm also HIV positive. And how much do I want to load this gun when a director is a director's in a position of hiring me? Certainly had we known um, that he was ill at the point in time that we were casting the movie, while we still would have liked to have had him do the part, uh, because of the span involved, no insurance company would ever have um, issued us a policy on, on Brad. He would have, we would never have been able to insure him. The fact that he felt that way and had to hide made me feel that we hadn't accomplished anything since Phil had died. That if Brad Davis felt that, that something was terribly wrong. It was a, a really unbelievable experience to 
to watch the person that you love and care about more than anyone else in the world just fade away. Stephen took no prisoners. He was uh, uh, incredibly eloquent and uh, infuriated um, by the numbers of funerals he had to go to in Hollywood where young men were buried and no mention was made of AIDS or gay. From that day till the day that Phil died, um, he was probably one of the most important people in my life. I will remember him getting arrested in Washington. I will remember him screaming, free the drugs. I will remember him going to dinner at his house for the first time to meet Paul Manette the night of the San Francisco earthquake. <laughs> and I lost a friend, Larry Lott, a couple of years ago. He was an actor who was a good man. And I lost a friend, Michael Hameson, who was one of the funniest people I knew. Phil Mandelker died in March of 1984. He was in his mid-40s. David Camacho was 26 years old when he was diagnosed with AIDS. He died when he was 28 years old. My friend Donnie died too young last January, and we miss him very much. Ben Rubin died in March of 1992, and he was in, he had just turned 30. Philip Linton was, I think, 27 years old when he died. Stephen Kolzak died on September 19, 1990. He was 37 years old. You don't realize what you've lost a lot of times until they're gone, and you realize I mean, it, it sounds really maudlin, but the world is not as funny a place. Um, you don't have that many friends in your life. And dancing. I'll remember Stephen dancing. What keeps us from going mad in the AIDS community is our belief where, you know, we still believe we can change things. But if there were enough of us who made the choice to say, this is who I am, so what? Or, this is who I am, take your best shot, which is really sort of what happens. I think it would be more and more difficult for the industry to discriminate. People with HIV in positions to reach other people have a responsibility, have decisions to make about disclosure and this is just mine. We're changing the role of gay people from victim to the person who is in charge of their own destiny, who takes responsibility for their life, who's not going to take any crap off anybody, and who's willing to fight and, and be arrested and, uh, and die for their rights if they have to. I don't want to be invisible anymore. I want to be seen on the screen. I want to be represented. There are people who are genuinely frightened. and not only frightened, but this industry that I have always thought uh, was uh, better than most in terms of humanistic issues, and it was caring and all of those things, uh, wasn't here. And that, for lots of reasons, rocked me. And I, uh, and I thought, well, clearly I, there's something that has to be done about this. And I began to think about what what could be done, what was appropriate, uh, what would be real, what would be uh, not just making noise, but doing something that uh, would change things. Uh, he called me one day uh, during a period of time that uh, uh, preceded my receipt of an award from APLA, and he told me a little bit about uh, uh, the fact that he'd become acutely aware of the fact that this industry, by this industry I mean the entertainment industry, seemed to have uh, a problem in uh, dealing with uh, 
not only the portrayal of uh, gay people and people with AIDS uh, in front of the camera, but uh, also and possibly more significantly with employment opportunities. I think Hollywood Supports can do something and say, I will do this, I will make positive images, I will be a positive image, in order to counterbalance all that noise on the other side. It's silence, I think, that's really our enemies. I think it is incumbent upon us as an industry to show an example uh, in how we deal with people in front of the camera and behind the camera. Hollywood Supports has been established by leading figures in the entertainment industry to provide education and structural changes to the industry in terms of personnel policies and insurance benefits affecting people with HIV and gays and lesbians and it is using the services of AIDS Project Los Angeles and the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation in providing education and counseling to the industry to counter AIDS phobia and homophobia. The only issue is whether somebody can get there on time and be able to do whatever they're supposed to do. There is no other issue for any job on any level. I don't think being HIV positive should stop anyone from doing anything. I know that I know that it should be treated differently. Um, I think precautions should be made. And uh, not precautions for safety for other people, but I think for the person, the individual themselves. The entertainment industry certainly shares the responsibility for getting the message of the, of the nature of this terrible disease uh, into the consciousness of the world population. Fight the ban that network television has on getting the information out. A lot of what Hollywood Sports is doing right now is educating people about what needs to be done to make the entertainment industry um, a safe and supportive place for people with HIV, people affected by HIV, and gays and lesbians who um, have been the victims of the homophobia that helped feed AIDS phobia. It's important that there be people who are public about being HIV positive. people who are fighting the good fight. Uh, it's not, I don't see it as something to be embarrassed about. Um, it's a medical condition. Well, I think it's uh, totally uh, unacceptable that uh, any illness be the kind of thing that makes the ill person somehow ashamed. I, I find that totally uh, uh, crazy. It's very important that in the present, after 11 years of battling the Holocaust, after, I don't know, 25 or 30 years of battling the stereotypes, we finally have diverse groups saying that it will not stand. What Hollywood Supports is about is no more Brad Davises. Uh, in this world. No more people feeling forced to live in the closet. I think the entertainment industry and the news media together have enormous power to change people's attitudes about everything. They don't just change them, they shape them. I think one thing that we can do to uh, assist in the problems of uh, homophobia and AIDS phobia in terms of uh, so-called middle America is in being sure that the portrayals uh, that appear in our products are uh, balanced uh, and fair. Yeah, I think we have to get to a point in, in uh, the business in television or movies where a gay character is a gay character just that's an incidental part of his life. We don't go to work, any of us in any business, to be heterosexual or homosexual. We go there to do the job. The product that we create and that we export all over the world is the best in the world. I mean, Americans make the best movies, the best television, um, and we have a, so much of an opportunity to educate and to alter people's opinions.
and there are people working today all the time and they can give their best. They're very productive. And this is the important thing is that let them be able to talk about it and take that stress off their shoulders. We cannot just bury one another. We have to say we have been here. What should people in the entertainment industry do? People know what they should do. 